Yeah, what's up, kids? It is the Fight Society podcast. Damon Martin over there. I'm Loper. I am over here. Look at you over there. How you doing after at UFC 214? Oh, uh, great event. Good, 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 good times on Saturday night. It was, it, it was awesome. Right? It felt it, it was the first time this year where it felt like we really had a big event. I don't mean any okay. event. well in the you. UFC, I should say. Bellator had a big event, obviously, but I think this is the first really big event in the UFC. Vanderlei <laughs> Silva and Chael Sonnen. Yeah, but they didn't. UFC has been down. I mean, well, no, I take that back. I take that back. UFC was at two eleven, two twelve, whatever. The one with uh, Stipe and uh, DeSantis that felt pretty big. That felt pretty big. But this one, I think, because John Jones was coming back, it just felt bigger. It was huge, and every fight. You could like almost connect to on the main card. Yeah. Well, the undercard was good too. I mean, Ricardo, I agree. Ricardo Lamas that knockout on Jason Knight, Brian Ortega that third round submission in his fight. There were some good fights on the undercard. But Not- if you're a casual fan, I'm just saying, you know, if you're just at like a random like B dubs, yeah, you know, you're hanging out eating wings and you, oh, cool, the UFC's on. I think if you've seen it before, like most of the people on the card. You would have known who they were. Yeah, Robbie Lawler, former champion. Cowboy yeah. fights on Fox all the time. People know him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was pretty incredible. And going in, I was excited. I was super excited for the Woodley Maya fight, which has caught so much heat. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I, I wasn't that disappointed because I kind of knew what it was going to be. I knew there was something that was up with Woodley, and and it turns out it's his shoulder, but. It just seemed like he was having a hard time firing and and finding uh, the or I should say like the times that he could have gotten stuff off, he didn't. And you were like, "What's going on here?" Especially later in the fight. I don't fault Woodley for the game plan whatsoever because if you go in there and you fight a guy like Damian Maya, a very big welterweight who you know wants to get you to the ground and submit you, I don't fault him for the idea and the game plan of stuffing the takedowns and making Maya work for everything he got. I, I totally agree with that. I think, uh, but I also think the criticism is fair in terms of the performance when, you know, it's like, I've, I've used this analogy a couple times this week. It's like a great defensive team in football. You know what I mean? Like it's great to see a defense just completely shut somebody down, but at some point you still have to score points to win the game. You know what I mean? Now Woodley had that one knockdown early and you're like, all right, you know, he's going to, he's going to put it on him. And then he just never did. And so, I don't fault him for the game plan. I don't think you should criticize him for the game plan, but I think you can still have an opinion about it being a not exciting fight and saying that he probably later in the rounds, I think in the fourth and fifth round, he should have gone for it more, and I think he would have gotten the knockout. So I think both are fair. I think it's fair to criticize him for not gunning for a finish when it seemed like there were openings, especially in the fourth and fifth round when Maya's shots were so sloppy and coming from so far outside. I mean, he was diving from like five feet away just trying to get a takedown at that point it was it was kind of sad right but i mean like a division one all-american wrestler good luck man i get it once you get on the ground if you are a high level jujitsu black belt i mean damian maya might be the prime example of the highest level in mma when it comes to jujitsu black belts but you know, you might have the advantage once you're on the ground, or or he might have been able to get to an advantage point and then get the submission. But getting an all American wrestler down on the mat, good luck. Well, and I think Maya, I think because of Woodley's power, Maya adjusted the way he takes people down. Because look at his fights with Jorge Masvidal. Look at his fight with Matt. Mm-hmm. Look at some. Of, he does not just die for legs. You know what I mean? He's a guy who gets inside. Wants to get the clinch going. Gets the clinch and drags you to the mat. He may even pull you on top of him and then go for a sweep. And they're always like weird, snaky type takedowns yeah. that you've never seen before. Or he'll grab a single leg and he'll literally wrap himself around a leg and kind of drag you to the mat. He didn't do any of that. He was shooting for double legs. Damian Mile, not... he'll pull guard too. I mean, yeah. like, you know, he's not he's not as scared to pull guard, but, but... He was clearly worried about Woodley's power, and rightly so. If I'm fighting Tyron Woodley, the last yeah. thing you want to do is get hit by one of those left or right hands. So I don't fault him, but that's what I said. He was shooting from so far away. As soon as he missed those first... I mean, he had like 20, 24 or 21 takedown attempts. I think after like 10 and you shut him down that much, then at that point, I feel like you got to open up your offense a little bit more because he's tired. He's still shooting from way outside. Clearly, he's worried about your power. That's when you got to start unleashing a little bit. So I think the criticism is fair, although I will say the criticism in the fight should not have come from Dana White. I don't understand as a promoter how you demean a guy who you're going to try to sell again in six months in a pay-per-view. 
You know what I mean? Like you rip him to shreds. He said, "Who's gonna Who's gonna pay to see Tyron Woodley again?" Well, you better hope somebody because you're gonna put him on a pay per view six months from now. Well, I think intelligent fans and people around the sport, like I see through that shit. Like I, I know what it is. I don't think he got to execute his game plan. Like you, you know, we were talking about earlier. I think that you know his game plan. There's much more in that game plan. If he had not gotten hurt. Early in the fight, I mean, a torn labor. I mean, that's what I'm going through right now, and I get it, man. That shit is gnarly. I can't, I can't even imagine if it happened in round one or two of a championship fight for the welterweight belt in the UFC with all those eyes watching. And you already feel like a bunch of people hate you, anyways. You know, like I mean, so you have having sympathy he, pains first. No, time. I don't. I just, <laughs> I, I get like. Here's the thing with the sport. I think like when people watch football games. And, you know, you talk to people, it's not uncommon to hear like, oh, well, yeah, I kind of knew that's how that was going to turn out. Yeah, that's kind of I, I didn't think people were going to be ecstatic with this fight. And that's why I was really wondering why they were going to make GSP versus Tyron Woodley. No, because I, I mean, do we remember who GSP is? I mean, like you see him in the gi and like all of a sudden people think he's like a karate striker like Stephen Thompson. Yes, he's got, you know, better than most striking. But, I mean, he was the lay and pray of all. I mean, like, you know, wrestle fuck. I mean, that kind of defines in a lot of people's minds who GSP was. Not in my mind, but in a lot of people, when you say GSP, that's what a lot of people think of. So I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I'm like, so they're, they already think Tyron's a boring fighter because he's cautious or uh, in some fights he, he wants to grapple too much. That's been a complaint. So you're going to put these two fighters who are maybe the most criticized ever in the welterweight division and put them against each other. I just didn't ever see how that was going to be a great fight and people were going to be pumped for that. I think people, well, I think people are happy are, about the turnout. Yeah, I think people are going to be pumped about George St. Pierre regardless, but it's so weird because I think people have like this weird, weird memory of George because George took a lot of flack during his title reign about how he the didn't most. finish guys and he yeah. was you know, playing it safe. He started out wrestling guys as opposed to striking with guys. Well, it even ended with the Johnny Hendricks yeah, uh, so, decision. You know, most people thought Johnny yeah. won that fight. But I also think part of the criticism that's coming at Tyron is I, when I say self-inflicted, I don't mean it in a bad way. I mean it in a good way because he does. When he goes out there and knocks the hell out of Ty, or out of Dong Hyun Kim and he knocks right. out Robbie Lawler in the first round, he sets that stage to say, look at what this guy can do. And then when he doesn't do that, when he has kind of a lackluster, I won't say lackluster, he won. It was a shut-up performance. It was not even close on the scorecard. So you can't say it's a bad performance. You can just say that he didn't. he didn't go for it as much as we all believe he should have. And that's not a that's not even really a criticism as much as it's a compliment to Tyron Woodley because I think Tyron Woodley could have finished him. But if he's hurt, like what do you say? Well, yeah, I know, but still, I mean, listen, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there is a there is an element of excitement, an element of entertainment in all the fights, and and I don't think you should ever fault a guy for playing it smart and not you know playing into a guy's game. Just like what he did with Wonder Boy, not going after Wonder Boy and allowing Wonder Boy to pick him apart from the outside. He made Wonder Boy come after him, which allowed him to close the distance. Every time Wonder Boy got close, Tyron was able to leap forward and hit him, and that's why he won that fight. Both of those fights, really, if you want to look at, you know, who did more damage in the first fight. Um, but like I said, it's, I think it's, he's kind of a victim of his own success because when you see him go out there and knock out Dong Hyun Kim, you see him go out there and knock the hell out of Robbie Lawler in the first round one punch and just puts no, him shocking. down. Absolutely. You just want to see more of that. So that's, I, he, I, that's the best way I can describe it. He's a victim of his own success because when you have those kind of just vicious, I think he said nine first round finishes. Awesome. Now everyone wants to see nine more first round finishes. And when you don't deliver that, they're a little harder on you. And it's just like Anderson Silva, one of the greatest fighters of all time. When he would go out there and land that front face kick to Vitor Belfort. Everybody wanted You want to see time. it, but when he goes out there and has that Talis Leites fight, he goes out there and has, has the fight to Damian, Damian Maya in Abu Dhabi. Tell me this is not the same fight, man. Yeah. And Dana, remember how crazy Dana went because that I was know. like after the supposed loan and all that yeah. stuff and, you know, here we were showcasing the sport in front of Abu Dhabi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so that's that. That's exactly what this is. He's a guy who's, who's set the stage for these really exciting performances and when he doesn't have them, People are critical of him, and I don't. I don't think it's unfair. I don't think the fans are unfair in that because you, they want. Because I guarantee, if Tyron Woodley goes out there in his next fight and knocks the hell out of somebody, whether it's Robbie Lawler or Jorge Masvidal or whoever it ends up being, and knocks him out in the first round, the love affair with Tyron Woodley will be back on again. Because that's Anderson went through the same thing. As great as Anderson is and was, 
He had a couple stinkers during his career. Well, you remember Dana threatened to strip him of the title yeah, I mean, like, come after on. that fight in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, so this is nothing new. And But like I said, my biggest problem with the whole thing is Dana. Dana criticizing him to the point of like burying him. I mean, he buried him in those post-fight comments. And I'm just like, man, I don't under I understand Dana is a passionate fan to go along with being a promoter, and I think there's something you can appreciate about that because you don't get that filter that you get with other sports owners where it's like the cliche like Bull Durham lines, like we gotta go out there and play him one game at a time and that kind of shit. But then again, you're you're in six months you're gonna ask people to buy him and Robbie Lawler. You're gonna ask people to buy him and Jorge Masvidal on some kind of a card. And I just don't understand why you can you can sit there and say, you know what, it wasn't the greatest fight in the world. I wish you would have done more. Uh but you know, these things happen, you know, it's part of the sport. You're not gonna have every fight's not gonna be a knockdown drag out war. Right. And be done with it. I don't really see the need in just absolutely burying the guy. So is that what is next? You think uh, Jorge Masvidal? Well, they're saying Robbie Lawler. They're saying Lawler rematch. What do you? But what do you think, man? I think if if I think you got to get some new blood in there. To be honest with you, I listen. Robbie came back from a year off. Do you really think that was a unanimous win that no, he got over Cowboy? It was very close. I don't. I don't think so either. And that's why I kind of think, you know, Jorge Masvidal finished Cowboy in devastating fashion. And I know MMA math shouldn't always add up, but. I think in this case you got to respect that. So if Robbie's going to get a title shot based off a of cowboy, you got to look at the way that Jorge finished cowboy. And Jorge lost the split decision to Damian Maya. It was a good fight. It was a very close fight. You know what I mean? Um, it, he wouldn't be the first guy in the world to get a title shot off a, off a loss. And at the same time, if Woodley's going to be out for six months with a torn That's, labrum, so he took. The, I forgot that he took that fight. You're absolutely yeah, right. And, yeah, and Woodley's been very active. I mean, Woodley just fought in March. Now he fought again in July. I mean, if he wanted to take six months off, I don't think anyone would fault him. There's been a lot of rumors that Jorge Masvidal wants to fight Wonder Boy. If he beats Wonder Boy, I think you give it to That'd Masvidal. Be a great fight, too. and that's not because I don't think Lawler should get back in there. I just think it was a year ago. He got knocked out in the first round one year ago. What now about, because what about Wonder Boy Lawler? That would be a fun fight. That would be a fun fight. Give Masvidal the title shot and give Wonder Boy to Woodley or to Lawler. They want they Woodley, well, you know Wonder Boy wanted that fight. Now that you say that about Damian Maya, I forgot that Masvidal lost to him. So almost maybe give Masvidal the winner of the Lawler fight and you, well, because Tyron Woodley is going to have to get uh, shoulder surgery. Well, he said he's not sure. He said he's going. Yeah. He, he said he might. He might not. Hopefully not. With well, with torn labrum, you, you don't necessarily have to. You you can train like resistance bands. Like I have uh, actually with my shoulder, I tore uh, like the cartilage in the shoulder, and with the tear, like pieces of cartilage, I have like pieces of like cartilage down by my uh, bicep area. So I may have to get surgery because of that. But if I didn't, the tear even in the cartilage, you can repair that. Like with, you know, resistance bands, <laughs> this is easy for me to say, but, you know, with different uh, therapies and uh, physical therapy and, and massage and just strengthening the joints is the most important part. So that way, you know, later, once you are rehabbed, you can prehab and keep doing that kind of stuff and train harder. Yeah. I mean, listen, Woodley deserves a break. I mean, the guy fought in November. He fought in March. He fought in July. If he wanted to take six months off or eight months off, I don't think anyone would fault him. Now, I don't know that Tyron wants that much time off. If he recovers and he can fight in December, he may want to fight in December and, and great for, you know, good for him. But I don't have a problem if he wants to sit out and let this division play out a little bit because I don't disagree with him saying Robbie Lawler probably doesn't deserve a shot. He had one fight, a very close fight with Cowboy. And that's a year after he got knocked out in the first round by Tyron Woodley. And just because Tyron's active, I mean, Tyron's fought three times since then, and Lawler just came back. Now, I don't fault Lawler for sitting out because if you don't feel you're healthy enough from a concussion, you shouldn't fight. No, kudos, for sure. Kudos to you. Applaud you, Robbie Lawler, for not coming back sooner and just to appease the fans and instead letting your head rest and letting your brain rest and not coming back when you're not really 100% ready. I applaud him for that. But at the same time, you can't also say one fight in a very close, I won't say, I won't say controversial, it was a very close fight with Cowboy Cerrone suddenly deems you the number one contender again just because you're an exciting guy. I think you should have to fight a Wonder Boy. I think you should have to fight a Masvidal. I think you should have to fight someone else. And if he gets another win, then I'm fine with it. But I think Masvidal is the guy I'd rather see in there. If you're going to give it to somebody right off the bat, Masvidal would be my pick. Even off a loss, I'd like to see that. There's a storyline there. Him and Tyron are teammates yep. at American Top Team. There's a little story there, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of tension, I imagine. Well, I imagine at some point Masvidal also trained with Robbie Lawler at American yeah, Top Team exactly. before he made the move up north. Yeah, and I think Wonder Boy 
Wonderboy said, I want to say Wonderboy said he would be back in October. If you can, if, if Woodley is going to be out for a while, then you book, you book Wonderboy and Masvidal. If Masvidal can win that fight, then I don't care if he's on a one fight win streak, you give him the title shot. I'm a, I'm a big Masvidal guy though. I make no bones about it. But I love what that if guy. Wonderboy wins? Then you're right back in the situation you're in now because you're not so going to Wonder see Wonderboy. So Wonderboy Robbie? Maybe. If he's healthy. But then you don't have a title fight. You don't have anyone to fight Woodley. I'm telling you, I think that Woodley's going to be out longer than people suspect. But he was furious at the thought of some sort of uh, interim title. Yeah, I mean, he was furious at Dana White in general, which it seems like they've kind of cooler heads have prevailed. But no, he was pissed and he was doing that stuff that, I mean, everybody's done it, you know, with whatever you're trying to do. You try to get mad at stuff that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. But as a way to, like, kind of hopefully put it out in the universe so it doesn't happen. Like, oh, and I don't even want to hear I didn't want to hear about an interim title. Like you could already tell that he was just putting it out there. Uh, I believe Ariel had him on, you know, talking about it, and he was so worked up about it. And I was like, man, don't let Dana know where it's getting you. Because, I mean, that's what Dana would love to do. Dude, you know, if you're going to put it on somebody, especially at that point when he's like, I'm going to leak stuff and, I'll, you know, whatever. Apparently, like you say, they've uh, spoke off well, the record and. Here's the thing. Made up a little bit. Here's the thing. I, I I don't disagree with anything that Tyron Woodley said in that interview and what he's done in subsequent interviews. I agree with him 100%. Dana but what about White. threatening to release like secrets? Okay, so that's where my problem comes in. Not because he's going to release secrets, but when you say that, when you say I'm going to start leaking shit, when that's what he right. says, you take the attention away from your cause and you put people into curiosity mode of what secrets does he have? What information does he have on Dana? Yeah. And you switch the conversation from where people, because people were on Tyron's side after Dana kind of threw him under the bus and backed it over him again and saying, listen, it wasn't a great fight, but come on, dude, you're his promoter. You're the guy who's supposed to tell people to buy his fights and you're just going to throw him under the bus like that and yeah. bury the guy. You were all, we were all on his side. Now I think we stayed on Tyron's side, but I think when you say things like "I'm gonna start leaking things," you take the attention away from your cause and you start making people concerned about what is it? What do you know? What what secrets do you have on Dana? We want to know, you know. And I think you take the cause away, which is funny. Our guest this week, Colby Covington, then came out on Twitter and said, "Don't worry, boss. If uh, Tyron Woodley leaks something, I got some stuff on him that'll ruin his life." And, and so that's, I, I called Colby Covington last night and we got on the comp, we got on the phone and talked about this Tyron Woodley situation because technically they're both American top team. So it was really weird to me. I was like, why this is Colby Covington is going ham on Tyron Woodley. Like he did it after his fight too. When he beat Dong Hyun Kim a couple months ago, afterwards, he's like on the mic and he's like, I'll bury Tyron Woodley. That's an easy fight or something. I was like, Whoa. ATT guys typically don't do that, but Colby Covington explained in the interview that you'll hear in just a few minutes why he doesn't consider Tyron Woodley a teammate, and he doesn't divulge what information he knows, but he said, basically, long story short, it's something that uh, that Tyron Woodley would not enjoy being out there. Well, let's hear it right now. Damon Martin, one-on-one -on -one with Colby. We are joined today by one of the top welterweights in the world, a man who proclaims that he will be champion sooner rather than later. Welcome into the show today, Colby Covington. Colby, welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, I'm not proclaiming I'm going to be champion. I know with destiny I will be champion. I love it. I love it. Your last fight, of course, a, a lopsided, very dominant performance over a top 10 fighter. Uh, you've been waiting for that opportunity. You were just kind of anxious, you know, waiting for that chance for them to finally give you that top 10 opponent. How, how good did it feel to not only get that win, but to dominate a guy like Dong Hyun Kim, who, let's be honest, he's a tough guy. I mean, that's not an easy fight. It was for you, but it's not generally an easy fight. Yeah, man, he, he he's a killer, but uh, it goes about what I was talking about before, that those rankings, they don't mean anything, you know? Don't believe everything you read. Seeing is reading. You saw what I done, did to Dung Hum Kim. That wasn't my best performance. Watch what I do to my next opponent. <laughs> I love it. So, you know, since that time, you've been very vocal about, you know, the matchups you want and the kind of fights you, uh, you, you've been getting out there. And obviously you've been, uh, you know, you've been very vocal about what you want. Is that, uh, I don't know, you tell me, is that something you just kind of consciously said, hey, I'm going to go out there and, you know, start telling people what I want, what I asked for? Or, or how has that been, you know, this last, you know, it seems like you've been very, very vocal this last, you know, year, year and a half of your career. I'm just reminding everybody that I'm here now. This is my time. All these guys that are older, Damian Maya, Tyrone Woodley, Robbie Lawler, all these guys are old, man. They're past their time. There's timing in the sport. And this is my time. So I'm just reminding everybody that this is my time and that I'm going to come shine and beat their ass soon. 
Yeah. I know Dana White, he always says this is a young man's sport. I guess you're just proving that fact, right? It's absolutely true, man. This is a young man's sport and um, a lot of old dogs in the welterweight division. You know, it's, it's aging like milk. <laughs> so now with that said, there's lots I want to talk to you about today, Colby. Let me kind of start with, you know, what comes next for you? Because you came off that win over Kim. I know you wanted Rafael Dos Anjos. I know you mentioned Neil Magny. Now they're fighting each other. What happened there? I, I, it seemed like kind of a natural fit that you would get one of those guys, and now they're fighting each other. Yeah, man. It's, they're like the plague. You know, everybody's ducking me like the plague. You know, I, I am the plague. I'm the toughest fight in the top ten. You know, that kind of goes to to show, you know, all these guys that are ducking me, that kind of tells you the story as it is. You know, they know I'm the best fighter in the world. They know I'm number one now. So no one wants to fight the, the true best fighter in the world. So, you know, that's what it is. Everybody's ducking me. Rafael Dos Anjos, Neil Magny, they're my bitch for this life and the afterlife. <laughs> so now with them out of the way, I mean, what, what fight does interest you the most right now? Is there anybody that's out there that, you know, that, that, that does kind of come to mind as far as, you know, who you'd like to fight next? If they're out of the mix, who else is out there for you? Yeah, I mean, I thought Damian Maya was going to retire, and I was going to leave him alone. You know, he's going into retirement. That's 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 some that's some dick move to call some dude out that's in retirement. But you know, since he was after the fight, he was saying, "Oh, I got tons of fight in me left. I'm going to keep fighting on like a true fighter." Then, man, let's fight, man. Let's not waste no more time, man. You're like 50 years old. You you're getting gray gray hair on your head. So let's do it while you still got anything left in the tank. You know, I'd love to be the one to retire him. So. I got my eyes fully focused on Damian Maya right now. Okay. What did you think of uh, of Maya's performance against Tyron Woodley? Um, you know, that's what I kind of expected. You know, Maya's one-dimensional. He doesn't really bring much to the table in striking. All he can do is put you up against the cage, get a body lock, get to your back, get a rear naked choke. That's about all he does. He's never really knocked anybody out. He's never really showed striking or beaten anybody in the striking aspects of the fight. So, you know, he's very one-dimensional. That's what I kind of figured. Tyron Woodley would just back up to the fence, you know, make it a, it would be a boring fight. You know, he would just not throw too many punches because he's cautious and he's playing it safe because he's old now and he doesn't have any gas left in the tank. So, you know, that's kind of what I expected, you know, uh, a boring fight. Damian Maia trying to push him against the cage and, and, and Woodley throwing one or two shots and then just backing back up and backing up. And, you know, it was – that's not a championship performance. I tell you right now, you put me in there for a world title for that type of money, I'm going to fight for championship performances. And you're always – it's always going to be an entertaining show when I'm in there. Yeah. After the fight was over, you know, obviously, you know, there was a lot of criticism of, of Tyron and Damian Maya for that performance. Dana was very vocal about that. And I'll get to Tyron Woodley in a second because uh, I know, obviously, that's some things you've had to say about him on Twitter. But, I mean, is it fair when there, is a, when there isn't the, the most exciting fight in the world? I don't fault Tyron Woodley for the game plan. You know, playing into Damian Maya's jiu-jitsu world is, is that's giving him the one chance he has to really win. You know, I understand that. But is there fair criticism when there's a fight like that? Is it fair to criticize a fighter for a performance like that or or should we still applaud them because it was a smart game plan um you know i i think i think it's fair you know this is the entertainment business he didn't put on an entertaining show you know that was boring man no one wants to see that you better do some some stuff in your walk out of this or say some stuff in the interviews but he's out here saying oh racism everybody talks shit on me because they're racist like he's pulling that bullshit card that's the bitch move man everybody's been doing that since 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 how long ago so you know i think his criticism is warranted and he's a little bitch after your fight with dong hyun kim you mentioned tyron woodley by name now me as you know kind of the outsider looking in i always american top team as a team you know you guys are very very close-knit i know that's a family down there you know the coaches the guys who you work with that is very much a family so it kind of took me off guard a little bit because i i consider tyron woodley to be part of att now i saw another interview you did yesterday i believe it was where you talked about how you don't really view tyron woodley as a, as a teammate necessarily can you kind of explain that to me because i was a little taken back only because i know how tight att is and I know you guys are like brothers and sisters down there and you always have each other's backs so I was a little shocked the first time you said it now I read your interview yesterday but I kind of I kind of want to hear it from you yourself like why it's different with Tyron Woodley why you don't really consider him a teammate okay why I don't consider him a teammate is he trains full-time in St. Louis he doesn't come to Coconut Creek I think he came by one time and that was only because Dan Lambert was going to take him out for steak so Besides that time for him coming down so our manager could put him up and give him, you know, a nice steak dinner to calm him down from his boring fighting ways, he does, I don't consider him a teammate. He, he trains in St. Louis. He's at Rufus Sport. Look who's in his corner. He's got Rufus Sport. 
what do you, what do you want to claim, man? That's like me going to Jackson Wink or something and being like, oh yeah, I'm part of ATT, but I'm Jackson Wink too. You can't be in the middle. You can't be. You have to pick a side. Like, are you ATT or are you Rufus Sport? Are you St. Louis? What are you? You know. So, you know, I think he's fake. You know, I, there's a lot of people that he caused drama with in the past. You know, with Robbie and Hector Lombard and and guys like that. So. You know, I don't really consider him a teammate, and you know he's never shown friendliness to me. When I came out to help him for the Roy McDonald fight, helped him. You know, pretty much just revolved around his schedule, training with him, doing this day and day night. You know, then the next time I saw him at a UFC event, when I had a fight, he acted like he didn't even know me. So that's just how I thought it was funny that I was beating his ass in training, and then he doesn't want to show me the respect behind curtains when we're at a UFC event. So. He's a fake motherfucker, and that's why I sent that tweet out. You know, he he trying to threaten Dana, hold him to gunpoint. Well, motherfucker, I'm gonna put you to gunpoint then. Let's see how you respond to that because you a fake motherfucker. Yeah. So you said now I'm not gonna ask you to reveal in, information and stuff like that, but I, you know, everyone, listen when you when you when you're around a camp, I understand there are secrets that are out there. So it sounds like you're pretty confident that whatever you have to say is something that Tyron Woodley wouldn't exactly want out there. Is that safe to say? Uh, I'm 110 percent confident that. Woodley does not want out what out there what I would say, but I'm not going to ruin his life because Dan Lambert told me and, and I made a promise to him that I wouldn't do that. So let's just say Woodley, you're on thin ice, motherfucker. You better watch your words wisely how you go about business. Yeah, well, you you know you mentioned it, and he is the champion. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what you want. You want that gold belt. So I mean, I gotta imagine that's a. I mean, listen, he's gonna have a target on his back no matter what. But I imagine that's got to be a big part of it because he has what you want, right? I mean, that's why you want that fight. You want what he has. Absolutely, man. You know he's he's got exa- everything I want. You know, I believe this is my time, and you know he you know he's got to he's got to he's got to be a champion. You got to carry yourself like a champion, man. Guys are going to be coming after you. They're going to be attacking you. They're going to want that fight. He was doing the same shit, you know. So don't be a hypocrite and be like, "Oh, you can't go about your business, motherfucker. You got your you got yours in a boom market at a time when, you know, people weren't getting that and now you got it, so you you don't want anybody else to get it? Like that's not fair, man. Like and it's not really true to you're not the best fighter in the world. If you're the best fighter in the world, you should want to fight the best fighters in the world, but instead you want super fights because you're scared to fight other guys. So, you know, I want what he's got. I believe I'm the best fighter in the world right now. And I'm it's only a matter of time until I show the world. Yeah. Now I know you also mentioned you would be in for a fight if it was offered to you against a guy like Robbie Lawler, who I know is a former teammate, but he is no longer at ATT. Is a little different situation with Robbie. I mean, I imagine as a, as a guy training at ATT, because I know when he split that you know there were some bad feelings there on both sides, whatever the case may be. But I don't think it was a, a nasty split. Like I don't think everyone hated him when he left. But I don't know how how do you feel about Robbie, and, and is that a fight you'd be interested in? Uh, you know, I respect Robbie as a fighter, what he's done, his accomplishments, but he's in my division now. This is my division. I'm making it known this is my division. Every second that goes by, it's only getting worse for these guys. Robbie Lawler, Tyrone Woodley, Damian Maya, all these three old-ass motherfuckers pass their time. I'm letting them all know this is my division. Robbie Lawler can get it too, you know. I don't want to bring up facts, you know, about all the damage he's taken in his career, but... At the end of the day, that's a pretty easy fight for me. You know, I've trained with him, but I respect him. But, you know, he's got what I want, too. He's got a ranking above me, and I want all the rankings above me all the way to number one. So if you're in my way, I'm sorry. It's nothing personal. It's just business. Yeah. I know, as I said before, everyone in the American top team is very close. So I'm quite sure the guys that do fight in your division, a guy like Tiago Alves, who is a legend, and I'm sure a guy you know very well, guys you train with at ATT, those are like family to you. But this is also an individual sport. And I think at some point you have to become selfish, right? I mean, you have to worry about yourself and worry about what's in front of you. And so, you know, anything else aside, I mean, anything that's in front of you, anyone that's ranked above you, teammate or no, I mean, that's, that's, that's the point, though. You want what they have. You want that ranking. You want that championship. And that's, I imagine, it's not really personal but at some time you have to be selfish right like you have to put everything else aside and worry about yourself and it kind of sounds like what you're doing like hey this is my time now it's time for me to go get the gold absolutely man i I sat behind the scene for years man struggling not getting fights just helping train these guys 
just in here mopping them up in the gym every day. You know, I don't want to talk about gym stories, me beating them up. It is what it is now. Now it's time I'm going to prove it in the octagon. But, you know, back to that, you know, I, I put in my time, you know. I, I grinded with these guys. I helped them out when they were making the big paychecks. So they better not get mad at me. Now it's time for me. I want my big paychecks. I want my cut, you know. I gave you your cut. I let you get your little freedom. But now I'm coming after them. It's nothing personal. And I didn't come in here to make friends, you know, Damon. I got enough friends, man. I got <laughs> plenty of friends back home in in Oregon, so I ain't here to make friends, man. You're my friend. You're cool. I consider you a friend, but I'm not here to make friends with any other martial artists, so I don't really give a fuck what they say about me. Yeah. Well, what's, what's, what's great, Colby, is that, you know, the progression you've made, the ev evolution you've made, especially because you came in. Now, I'm a wrestling guy. That's the background. I love wrestling. I love collegiate wrestling, so I always kind of have a special place for the wrestlers that come in, but you have worked tirelessly to add on to the other elements of your game, and I think we saw a lot of that in the Dong Young Kim fight where, you know, you knew you could take him down at any point, but you also able to work him on the feet. You were able to work with your submissions i mean it feels like you really have kind of hit a stride right now and i gotta imagine that plays a big part in your confidence that you do feel like you can go out there and not only compete with these guys but you're ready to beat anybody and i think that i'm, I'm just guessing maybe you can tell me better but it sounds like that's a big part of what you're saying and why you're ready for a tyron woodley or a damian myers because you know that you are the well-rounded guy that can beat them anywhere at this point yep i feel like there's no one that can do what i can do no one can mix up the the martial arts like i can right now my striking has hit a new level my my wrestling's the highest level there is there isn't a more higher level than you get with my wrestling so you know i got olympic level wrestling and and you know now i got world level muay thai and kickboxing so and my jiu-jitsu submission skills speak for themselves you know i got like seven or eight submissions so you know I, everything's coming together i feel great you know you know what else Sam? i actually other, hired a new strength and conditioning coach you know a guy named stevie richards absolutely yeah, man. So, uh, you know, we're going to revolutionize. He's coming in to help me, you know. What's better to have a former pro wrestler that, you know, didn't, didn't cheat. He went by the book, you know, all natural man, you know. Didn't have to put steroids in his body. Hard worker. Look at his body now. I mean, he's shredded, you know. So, you know, the game's changing, man. He's coming in to be my strength and conditioning coach for this world title run, and we're going to get that world championship belt together. I love it. I love it. And that's, it's like anything else. It's just like the elements you add to make you better. That's just one more layer to make you an even better fighter, right? I mean, that's just one more thing to get you yep. to that gold. One, one more level, man. It's just an extra edge that I'm creating for myself. None of these welterweights can keep up right now. And now we're just going to put them down and they ain't going to have a chance to get back up. Yeah. Now you mentioned earlier, and I agree with you, that there is obviously an entertainment level to this sport. You have to be entertaining. And I tell fighters this all the time. I say, listen, you get 15 or 25 minutes in the cage, but you have a lot of time when you're not in the cage to, you know, make people pay attention to you, whether it's interviews or Twitter or whatever it is you're doing, get people to pay attention to you. Now it's only been a little over, you know, it's been, you know, a little about six weeks since your fight. But do you feel like you are getting the attention you deserve now, Colby? It feels like people are talking about you. People are buzzing about you because now it's like, okay, when are you going to fight again? When, when are we going to see a fight? Like, I feel like you've kind of built that buzz around yourself. Have you been feeling that? Because a lot of times when a guy fights, you talk about him the day before, you talk about the day after, and then we don't hear about him again for five months until they fight again. Yeah, you know, I, I think... I think uh, a lot of people are, are noticing my realness. I'm getting a lot of fans because they're seeing my realness. I'm calling a spade a spade. All these guys that I've been asking to fight in the top 15, literally every single one turned me down. Sean Shelby knows. Dana White knows. They know the real tr truth. And now the fans are starting to see it. So they're starting to lobby behind me, and they're starting to rally. And, and they're realizing that I am the best fighter in the world, and this really is the embarrassment tour. I'm coming and embarrassing all these fighters. I haven't lost one round. So... You know, I really do feel like I'm getting more notoriety because of my realness. Yeah, I love it. So with that said, Colby, as I said, it's been about six weeks. I know you're in the gym right now. How soon would you like to book your next fight? I mean, I know you mentioned Damian Maya. He's coming off a five-round fight, so I imagine he's probably not going to come back, you know, tomorrow. But, I mean, when do you want to come back? I mean, are you willing to wait a little longer to get a guy like Damian Maya or Robbie Lawler or whoever's at the top of the division? Or would you rather fight sooner and just get a fight in again? Um, I would rather wait for those guys to heal their little boo-boos. I know they, they might have stubbed their toe in their fights, you know. They're pretty boring and un, un, you know, un very good shitty fights, you know. They weren't, they weren't any, any crowd-pleasing type fights. So, you know, I know they got some little boo-boos to lick their wounds with. So, you know, I want to wait for them, man. I'm looking for the big fights. I want the biggest fights. I want to test myself. I want to prove to everybody, all my, my haters too, because I got a lot of haters too, I want to prove to them that, 
they're just a bunch of marks that don't know nothing, man. They're a bunch of uneducated fools, and I'm going to show them the truth soon. I love it. Well, Colby, I appreciate the time, man. I cannot wait to see you back in the octagon. Uh, you made a believer out of me. Like I said, your last performance was amazing, and I'm excited to see you fight again. I know you got a great team around you. I'm a big fan of Stevie Richards. I'll be honest. I think that's a great addition to your team. And uh, like I said, man, thank you so much for taking the time, and I look forward to seeing you back in action, hopefully sooner rather than later. Much respect, Dammy. You know I'm always ready. That's the realest. I'm ready to fight next month if they need me, but, you know, I want the right fight. I'm looking for a title shot, so thanks for having me on. Absolutely, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon, right. man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. A very fired-up Colby Covington there. It's Loper and Damon Martin on the Fight Society podcast. Thanks to our friends over at MMA weekly for having us on the channel and we're having fun man it's good to be back always so uh here's the deal we are on social media at damon martin at jeremy loper so you can get us at jeremy loper at damon martin it's very easy hashtag fight society so is that the deal you said here's the deal well i just want to let them down on the down (laughs) low what the effing deal is what is the effing deal man uh, we're on social media. We're on social media. Uh, I, I, don't, I like to tell a lot of people. UFC 214, before we uh, get any further, John Jones. We haven't had a chance to talk about John Jones. John Jones was a... Man, as the fight was getting closer, I think everybody started to have questions. They were like, whoa, what? what maybe, what? It, just maybe he's not exactly the same. Yeah. And John Jones looking a little more trim. Came in at 215. Yep. And came in, and I want to say, like, you know, I I thought my first opinion was he opened the fight, and it was kind of like the old John, but Daniel Cormier was on it, man. You know, he was was hot right out of the gate, and I think that that was a good move. It kind of put John back on his heels a little bit, kind of like what Robbie did to Cowboy. Yeah. Cormier was winning the early part of the fight. Round one was very close. Cormier clearly won round two. And at that point, going into round three, I'm thinking, man, you know, Cormier's really figured it out this time. You know what I mean? He figured it out. And John is taken back a little bit because Cormier's coming after him. He's landing some hard shots. He's not backing down. He's not overpowering him. That's what I was thinking, too. I wonder how his confidence was, you know. And then head kick. Boom. Duck, ducked his head, called his shot because he saw that tendency in, in Cormier to duck his head. Ducked his head and boom. Knocked him down. And then he just... The last guy, the last guy you want on top of you throwing punches who's not named Mark Coleman is John, John Jones. Jones. No doubt. That dude is vicious. I on mean, top. if you're John Jones, that was the f- that was the photo finish you wanted. That was the shut up everybody for all of the last couple of years yeah. finish. That was the shut up Daniel Cormier forever. Yeah. There's probably never going to be a third There's fight. There's not. I mean, Why would there ever be a third fight? You want to see that happen to Daniel Cormier again? I don't. I love Daniel Cormier. Very nice guy. Super cool. Most amazing fighter, I think, until John Jones. Uh, You know, it's so hard to compare everybody. I mean, you know, the the different legacies, the different times that they fought guys. I mean, Daniel Cormier is always going to be thought of with the best of the best. You know, winning multiple titles in the most important organizations i mean that that's that's what his legacy is going to be do you remember do you remember what i said last week about cormier and jones before the fight you remember what i said i said that cormier has the unfortunate timing to be carl malone and absolutely. charles barkley absolutely at a time when michael jordan exists because guys like that you know as i said malone eventually got a title i think with the lakers but like when he was in his prime with the jazz yeah that's right at the end they yeah, got him that's they right. got yeah, at the, the very end uh or barkley or, or you know you can name him mean, you can list a, a numerous guys who were playing during jordan's time who never got titles who are legends hall of famers but Jordan was Jordan, and that's where you're at right now with, with Daniel Cormier. Michael, uh, Michael Jordan was so good, his contemporaries, who were great, just couldn't quite get past him. And that's what Dan- – And so I think Daniel Cormier deserves a ton of credit for what he's done. He's been an amazing champion. He's been an amazing fighter. He's beaten everybody else at heavyweight and light heavyweight. But John Jones – is the GOAT. And I argued this on Saturday night, and I'll continue to argue it now. I said this before the fight, John Jones is the greatest fighter of all time. Now... Before the trouble, like, who disagreed with that? 
Well, the, people I feel like di- nobody. You people know? disagree with me on Twitter saying Anderson Silva is the greatest. I had some people saying George St. Pierre is the greatest. I had a lot of people angry because John Jones has you know fouled up in his life so many times. But I said, when you look at his resume and you look at the way he's just decimated guys, and he's had one fight in 24 or whatever career fights, one fight that you can point to and say that was kind of close, and that was the Gustafson fight. That's it. You cannot point to any other fight and say he didn't win just lopsided or finished. I mean, I was, I've was i been in a lot of John Jones fights, dude. When he won the title against Shogun, I remember watching that fight live in the arena. I remember watching him drop Leota Machida like a sack of potatoes <laughs> with that guillotine choke. I mean, he, he when he fought Rampage Jackson, he just toyed with him. He didn't go out there and just beat him. He basically picked his shots, and when he decided to finish the fight, he did. Like, he didn't. He's like, eh, fourth round, third round. All right, I'll go ahead and finish him. He was toying with him up to that point. You don't toy with a guy like Rampage Jackson who can land one punch and knock your head in the third row. John Jones can do that, though. John Jones is the greatest fighter of all time, and I don't think there's an argument at this point. I love Anderson Silva. I love George St. Pierre. But no one has the resume that John Jones has, and no one has done to the opponents that John Jones has, has done what he has done to them. He's had one one close fight. One. He's lost what? Maybe five rounds so total. What, so what is the likelihood of him fighting Brock Lesnar? Everybody is obsessed. They can't get enough. What do you think? Next year, July. I thought it was going to be this year. Then I realized that Brock's suspension wouldn't be up until minimum February, and that's assuming he would get back into the the testing pool right now. I know his contract with WWE runs through, I believe, April of next year. So my new guess, and I, I apologize for anyone that I was, I just got excited thinking it could happen in December. It won't happen in December, but I think July International Fight Week 2018, John will fight Gustafson first, December. My guess, end of the year card, the final card of the year, John versus Gustafson too. Great fight. John wins that, which I would pick him to win that fight. Lesnar, July, International Fight Week 2018, and it will be the biggest UFC fight in history. It will break Connor's record. I'll say that right now. It will break Connor's record. Oh, I think so too, which is the mainstream appeal of the fight. More people know who Brock Lesnar is than you think more people know who Brock Lesnar is than Floyd Mayweather? No, I don't think people I don't think more mainstream people I think I think I, I would say it's similar. You know what I mean? I think more people know Connor and Floyd now. Yeah, there's gonna be more like uh, traditional sports fans that are gonna watch Connor and yeah. uh a Mayweather. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not comparing this to Con. When I say bigger, I'm saying bigger than bigger than UFC. Fights. I know what you mean. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. It's, not gonna, it's not going to be bigger than Conor but, Mayweather. But, but I was I was trying to take it there. Like, yeah. I know where you were trying to take. Yeah, it. You were but, talking about Frankie or talking about. Uh, well, no, Frankie, I'm talking about, talking about like um, I'm, I'm talking about Conor and Nate, which was 1.5 million buys. I think Lesnar and Jones does more. Because you're oh, not easy, absolutely. No, you're totally right. Yeah, that's such a John Jones is the great, and John Jones is a draw himself. It's not like John Jones isn't a draw. He's a good draw. He draws fights. He's had a lot of big pay per views. When you put that element with the unknown of Brock Lesnar, the hulking, huge, massive heavyweight, the WWE superstar, the former heavyweight champion, all the elements are there to make it a massive fight. And I think the UFC would be. I, I, I'm not even. I'm not even saying like I. I would be absolutely excited for the fight. But I think the UFC's I think the UFC would be fools not to put that fight together. You need big fights. Ronda's gone. She's not coming back. Connor, in my opinion, will come back to the UFC, but he very largely may have one foot out the door. If he goes out there and knocks out Floyd Mayweather, he's never coming back, in my opinion. No, I think he stays gone forever. You? Um but let's just say he loses a 12-round decision, he comes back. It would be and- badass. It, it would cement him as a badass motherfucker forever if he knocked out Floyd Mayweather, came right back, and knocked out Max Holloway. Well, Connor has... I mean, I love Max. I'm just saying, like, you know, to well, knock out a guy like Max Connor Holloway. has tougher challenges ahead of him than John Jones, in my opinion. John Jones, has, John Jones has one hurdle left at light heavyweight, and that's Alexander Gustafson in the rematch. Now... I said this yesterday, and I'll say it by now. The only fight in the UFC today, of all the fighters on the roster, that I wouldn't put John Jones as a favorite in front of is Stipe Miocic. Stipe would be the one guy who I think would be a favorite he over get to him. John Jones. He's he's huge. He's got the reach. He has power. He has great wrestling. I, mean, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I would love to see like what their stats are. Oh, my God. That's, that's my – now, see, as a hardcore fan, that's my dream fight because Stipe <sighs> might be the one guy who can go out there and just knock John Jones – clean out imagine if he if they made that fight john jones t- title against title or at least for the heavyweight championship but you know what i'm saying champion against yeah. champion 
John Jones against Stipe. John Jones wins. He fights Lesnar for the championship. Well, no, see, I think you get the reverse of that. <laughs> Here's because one thing that 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 John complained about on on Saturday night, he said Stipe is not a big enough star. Which you know, whatever. I would say Stipe is a star in his own right, and he's he's a, he's a star. But I mean, he's not the star. No, he, he's not you know, Lesnar. It's not like if because everybody sees what Connor did, and yeah. now everybody wants well, so to do that. Well, so here's the thing. So you you go out and you fight Lesnar. Jones is Jones would be favored to beat Lesnar. Now I'm not saying he would win that fight because as much as people say John Jones would destroy Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar gets John Jones on the ground. It's going to be tough to get up. Yeah, <laughs> that dude is a. That's like that's like having a brick. That's like having a brick wall sit on top of you. So, but if he can evade him for the first round for sure, yeah. I mean, he's going to have and and that takes a lot out of Brock Lesnar. Like yeah. if he's shooting like Damian Maya was. But Brock Lesnar is no. a NCAA champion wrestler. But anyway, so my point is he fights Brock. By the end of the year, if Stipe can get a couple more title defenses in there, you know, there's rumors that maybe he's going to fight Cain Velasquez, maybe he fights Francis Ngannou. I would favor Stipe in both of those fights. He knocks out Francis. He knocks out Cain Velasquez. Uh, John Jones beats Gustafson and uh, Brock. Then Stipe and Jones is massive. It is a huge fight. So that's my dream fight, but I also want it to play out a little bit longer before it happens. But I think the UFC will absolutely I'm I'm putting my I'm putting my money down right now. We will see John Jones and Brock Lesnar fight in twenty eighteen. Yeah, I think both of them putting it out there in the universe. But the the the, uh, the deal is the rumor is that Brock Lesnar drops his title at SummerSlam. There's been rumors about that. He said on WWE was at Raw the other night. He he said that if he loses at SummerSlam, he's leaving the WWE. Which that's all gimmick. I don't know, man. It's only if he beats Greg the Hammer Valentine. <laughs> he's got he's under contract till I think April of next year. This is and also let's understand with Brock Lesnar. This is also a negotiating tactic because WWE wants to keep him. But the one thing I will say, and I said this yesterday, and I'll say it again right now, Brock Lesnar, I think. And I have to talk to Dave Meltzer because he's the expert on this kind of stuff. But I think Brock makes about $5 million a year from WWE, and he makes, you know, whatever, 20 appearances a year, which is nothing for most WWE wrestlers. But let's say he's making $5 million a year. He fights John Jones. He's going to clear ten to $15 million easy, easy in one night. Yeah, no doubt. Easy in one no night. Doubt. Maybe more. Maybe more. I think that pay-per-view is worth so much more. So – that could be his negotiating tactic. I'll re-sign with you guys at WWE, but you got to allow me to go have this fight with John Jones because that's a that's a massive. Well, payday. I think that's that's a no brainer for them because you know they think about. I think Triple H knows it too. You know, Triple H is the one that is obviously running the show creative wise for the WWE now for the most part. And I think that he knows that having those crossover stars with the UFC gives so much legitimacy to them. It's ridiculous. I yeah. mean, they they want to attach themselves to the UFC so bad for legitimacy purposes, and this just gives them an opportunity, an in, if you will, right there. It's perfect for them. What I want to ask, I want to ask this question: What would Vinnie Mac have to say about a Brock Jones fight? Vince McMahon. What do you think Vince McMahon would say about a Brock Lesnar? I think I think Vinnie Mac might be on the line. I think Vinnie Mac can give us a little uh, little insight. Screw that. you. <laughs> I think I, I think that uh, you know that could be easily the biggest fight of all time. It could, and you know what, John Jones would be favored. I would probably pick John Jones to win that fight, but I think people forget. If Brock Lesnar gets him on the mat, he's going to have 40 pounds on John Jones. Easy 40 pounds, maybe 50. He is an NCAA heavyweight championship wrestler, and that dude hits like a freaking truck. Remember what he did to Frank Mir? Yeah. I mean, John Jones, I think, is much better than Frank Mir. He is. But he's not going to be as big as Frank Mir. He is much better. And not in Frank Mir. The the second fight, do you remember Frank Mir coming out like he was a professional bodybuilder? It was insane. Brock is so big, and he's so strong. Like I said, I would pick John Jones to win that fight. But if Brock can throw John to the ground one time and get on top of him, it becomes really interesting because John Jones, he's gone with heavyweights in the gym. He's gone with Alistair Overeem. I'm pretty sure he's gone with Andre Olovsky and guys like that. Brock Lesnar is a beast. It's not a joke. The dude is a beast. If he gets on top of John Jones and starts laying down punches, look out. Look out is right. Now, before we get out of here, I got to pick my mom up from the airport, man. 
Um, let's talk about Cyborg. Yes. She gets a victory against Mom. And I mean, mom. mom was fucking pissed. I mean, like, listen, it was like in between rounds, she made like 15 sandwiches and the kids had to get dropped off at <laughs> soccer practice and she was getting her ass beat by Cyborg all at the same time. She stayed focused. <laughs> she was amazing. And she Tanya Evans took a be obviously she's yeah. an incredible athlete. I'm kidding. But she I mean, both of them, I mean, were just incredible that night i thought it was interesting that cyborg could not put her away until later what was it the third round yeah well i think part i think you got to give credit to tanya evinger for being tough and, no and tanya was amazing but i tough. also think cyborg had a lot of respect for her because you didn't see cyborg just go out there with reckless aggression like she does against a lot of people because when she goes out there against certain people she just doesn't feel threatened and i don't mean this in an offensive way when i say this please don't you know hit me and say oh my god she's better than this but i don't think she felt threatened when she fought leslie smith who is a great striker, by the way, has a knockout power in her hands, is a very good striker. But at 135 going up to 145, I don't think Cyborg feared her striking enough to where she couldn't just go out there and go balls to the wall and just, I mean, just waylay her. You know what I mean? Just go crazy. Um, same thing with her last, with Lena Landsberg. She wasn't threatened by Lena Landsberg. Tanya Evinger is a very good wrestler and a very good submission stylist, and a very good grinder. She's very good on the clinch, very good inside. I think Cyborg, I'm not saying Cyborg feared her in any way, shape, or form. I'm just saying I think she respected her enough to know that she should, she couldn't just go out there and hit the, you know, pedal to the metal and just go out there and just try to, you know, finish Tanya Evinger. And I think that's a credit to Tanya Evinger. I thought Cyborg fought smart. She fought tactical. And I think we saw a different side of Cyborg. She didn't just need to go out there and just, just waylay somebody to win. She fought smart. And then she still got the knockout. I think that's a huge credit to Chris Cyborg and her coaches, Jason Perillo. Tito Ortiz was in her corner. It was cool to see Tito Ortiz on UFC uh, television. That was, that was awesome. Well, he did think? that thing. He did that thing back at uh, International Fight Week where he did the Legends panel. With uh, there was a Don Fry and a couple oh, I didn't other even people. Know he did yeah, that. Oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, so they had him back. I was happy to see that. I was like, you know what? Good for you guys. So do you like, think it's Holly Holm? I think so. Yeah, it's the biggest fight. Uh, I love Megan Anderson. I'm a big Megan Anderson fan, but I think unfortunately the timing of her having to drop out of the fight is going to push her back a little bit. So I think what you do is you have Megan fight Kat Zingano. Kat Zingano wants it really bad. That's perfect. She's, yeah, Kat's coming off a loss though. You can't give her a title shot. Well. Again, no, UFC, I think that's a perfect fight with UFC. Megan, yeah. UFC has given plenty of people off losses, title shots, but Kat Zingano against Megan Anderson. Let Kat go up to 145, see what she can do. Let Megan Anderson get a fight in the UFC. Let Chris Cyborg fight Holly Holm later this year. I love it. It's Loper and Damon Martin. This is Fight Society Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. And each and every week, we bring you a brand new show. That's how it works at Damon Martin, at Jeremy Loper, and we will be back live next week. Thanks, bro. 